Our evening is sponsored tonight. Our theme is education and the future for Albertans, a fundamental leadership challenge. What's it going to look like? May I extend a warm welcome on behalf of our two sponsoring organizations, Calgary Public Teachers Local 38 and Calgary Separate Teachers Local 55. Also working on the organization committee, we also appreciate the contribution from Rocky View Local 35 and the Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils and they're represented here this evening. Our format, ladies and gentlemen, and is as follows. We're going to have the speakers do opening remarks for four minutes each, and we're going to begin in alphabetical order by name, by first name. They'll have four minutes. Uh, we then have three prepared questions that have been put together by the Political Action Committee that uh, helped organize this, and I'll be posing it to our candidates. We then are going to take audience questions, and you all have that awesome new smart technology called the file card. And, uh, if you would like to complete the question you would like asked, we'll be collecting them as we go along, and please keep writing them as the candidates are speaking, because we have volunteers who are going to come and get them. So Dennis and Sandra are going to be sorting the questions. Uh, with Jen and Good Luck are going to be rewriting them so I can read them. And we have some runners, uh, and that is Leslie and Ruth are going to come around and get them from you. So this is a highly organized machine here this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, to ensure that all things go as well as they should, having been a former politician, I have noticed that sometimes four minutes does not mean four minutes. So to help us all stay on time, I would like to ask our official timer, Mitchell Elser, who is a resource consultant at Alternative High School. Would you please stand? And what's going to happen at three minutes, he's going to hold up a card, gentlemen, that says one minute. Aha! Thirty seconds to go, he's going to hold up a sign that says thirty minutes. When time, thirty seconds remaining. Thank you. And when time's up, he's going to hold up a sign that says time's up. Fifteen seconds later, he's going to stand and invite you all to provide thunderous applause so that we can assist everybody to stay on time. So, okay, a reminder, if you'd be kind enough to keep completing those cards. We want to get to as many questions as we can. We set an hour aside for your questions, so we'll see how that goes. Allow me now to begin in alphabetical order. With our first speaker, we have microphones at the table, so they're going to share the microphones. <coughs> Our first speaker, Kent Kerr, is the first is a first-time provincial representative for downtown Calgary, and is a shadow minister for education and energy with the Alberta Liberal Caucus. Kent was a victim of a drive-by shooting in 1991, and then left, and was left him a quadriplegic. He subsequently pursued post-secondary studies in Mount Royal and completed his Bachelor of Arts and a law degree at the University of Calgary. Before entering politics, politics Kent was a lawyer at Fraser Milner. Uh, Cassidy Green, a national law firm. Kent lives in downtown Calgary, enjoys spending time with his nephew, Marshall Jackson and Parker. Would you please welcome the representative of the Liberal Party of Alberta, member of the legislature for Calgary Buffalo, Kent Hare. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to be here, to be here with the a august group of uh, public school supporters as well as parents who are interested in their children's future. For many uh, times over the last 40 years, uh, the education community has been the true opposition here in Alberta because at oftentimes we haven't simply elected that many opposition members. You have stood up for the principle of equality of opportunity. Whether you're born of a rich family or a poor family, you are going to get an opportunity to succeed in this province and primarily that's through having a publicly funded public education system that recognizes that that building block has to be there for all of our children to succeed in order for society to succeed. And I thank you for continuing on that battle here tonight because without equality of opportunity, I believe uh, Alberta will be a much shallower place. Let's turn to uh, some of the things uh, that have happened over the course of time. In my view, we've had a progressive conservative government over the last 25 years that has had tepid support at best for public education. You have seen uh, fits and starts of funding, fits and starts of uh, 
building programs. In fact, I don't think they build neighborhood schools in the, anymore. You look around, uh, there's uh, uh, holes all over the place where you should have public schools. This record is there for you to review and to see. You look at other things. Uh, they signed a, an agreement with the Alberta Teachers Association uh, in 2003 called the Learning Commission Report that recommended movement on class sizes. They did that with a negotiated settlement. They have never come close to reaching those numbers. And you see this here now. We have a government here who has, uh, although uh, restored some funding to education, 435 teachers were not hired back this year. We have a budget right now that I think is uh, forecasting, if I've been talking to uh, my teaching groups correctly, additional teaching shortages. This is in the wealthiest place on earth. Okay? This is in the wealthiest place on earth. And uh, I believe public education is one of those things that your citizenry is willing to pay for. Public education should not only be provided when the oil and gas wells are pumping or when uh, they have a good budget year. It should be provided for on a predictable, sustainable fashion. And if you can't get it from oil and gas revenues, you have to ask your citizenry to pay for it. And I believe public education, and that's your taxes, people, it is. If you want a predictable, sustainable funding, you have to ask your citizenry to pay for it. And that's what I believe we have done in this election. I don't know if any of you saw our election platform the other day. But we're saying we're going to publicly fund uh, preschool. We're going, to, we're going to move to kindergarten, full-time kindergarten, very quickly. We are going to eliminate funding for private schools that separate and divide our community within five years. We are going to stop that practice. We're going to bring communities and families together in a reasonable fashion that supports equality of opportunity. And that's what I'm here to stand for. I'm glad that you're here to uh, see what the other candidates and parties need to say. But I look forward to your commitment uh, both to public education and getting out to the ballot box here uh, whenever that may be. We're supposed to have an election day, but we got an election season. But uh, that's the way it is. But hey, it's wonderful to be here tonight, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Kenny. Good job on timing. Our next panelist, ladies and gentlemen, grew up in Lethbridge and attended Lethbridge College, taking business administration before transferring to the University of Lethbridge, where he completed his B.Ed. with a major in business education and a minor in mathematics. He has been in education for the past 21 years, with the last 11 years in administration. He has served as a representative for the ATA local, he currently sits on the Provincial Planning Committee for the annual Catholic School Trustees and Administrators Conference. He has been married to his wife, Christine, for 19 years and they have three children. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome the representative of the Wild Rose Party, candidate for Lethbridge West, Kevin Kinahan. Thank you very much, and it's quite an honor to be here. I'm, I'm glad to see so many people coming out, uh, especially teachers, because that's part of where where I get a little frustrated at times um, down south, and that's why I got involved involved with the Wild Rose Party because I'm a conservative at heart, um, and I love the grassroots. So when the Wild Rose Party started getting formed back in 2007, 2008, that's when I got involved because because of the grassroots aspect. Um, I've always had education on my heart, and it's, it's near and dear to me, and I'm a lifelong educator. Even if I get out of education and into politics, I'm still gonna be a lifelong learner. The Wild Rose Party came out with our education platform already, pre-election pre season, like Kent was saying, because it is important to us, and we wanna make sure that everybody understands what it is that, that we are looking for. Um, as a government, we certainly want to redirect some of the wasteful spending that is taking place in this, in this province right now. And education, along with healthcare, are the two areas that most of that funding should be going into. And when, when people talk about 85% you know, of the funding is going into personnel, well, absolutely it should be going into personnel because that's what education is about. So definitely 
putting and looking at long-term sustainable funding in education. We want more teachers into the classroom because the class sizes have gotten larger and larger. And if you look at what's happened over the last five years, or four and a half years with this five-year long-term agreement, I'm not so sure we can trust the, the government with, uh, with making long-term deals because although they, they forced everybody into the boards, into signing the, the initial agreement, the following year they didn't want to pay the increase because they said the AAWE, the, the index got changed, how they calculated. So we had to take them to court to get that changed. The year after that, the provincial budget did not include the amount that the teacher's increase was. And so if you remember that year, um, the, the board, Minister Hancock told us, go into deficit, don't worry about it, we'll cover it later. And most, most boards didn't do that, and so there was cuts, and then some rehiring, but not all. And again, last year, teacher salaries were covered, but nothing else. So there was cuts across the boards all over the place, and again, some money came back, but not all. So I'm not so sure we can trust this government with another long-term deal. Uh, so we are looking at long-term sustainable funding, letting everybody know, teachers, the school boards, what, what kind of funding will be available two, three years, making a deal and sticking to it. We are also looking at local, lo more locally based decision making. We want to get um, decisions back into the local boards. So enough of this provincial bargaining, enough of uh, uh, decisions being made in Edmonton. We want decisions to be made at the local level with school councils, with teachers, and with teachers with, with the ATA involved as well. <clears throat> we need and we have to have more support in special education. There's been three years of funding freezes with special ed, with review after review. That's one thing this government is good at, is reviewing things, not acting on it. So we need action on special education. We need to put more money into the classroom. We need to get class sizes down. And we need to do it in a sustainable way. And that's what the Wild Rose would work for. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Our next panelist earned his Bachelor of Arts with a Sociology Concentration from Athabasca University in 2005 and received his Bachelor of Laws from the University of Windsor. He first sought public office in the 2008 provincial election in the constituency of Calgary Mount Rose and he currently sits on two standing committees. On October 12, 2011, he was appointed to the Cabinet as the Minister for Services for Alberta by the new Premier, Alison Redford. Would you please welcome the representative of the Progressive Conservative Party, Alberta, member of the Legislature for Calgary, Mount Rose, Manmeet Miller. Thank you uh, very much. Is this on? No. 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 <laughs> hey. There we go. <coughs> Sir, will you give me an extra 15 seconds? <laughs> 10. All right. So it was a negotiation. Friends, uh, I'm very honored to be here this evening on an evening that I think has brought historic movements uh, in a positive direction for education in the province of Alberta. For the first time, uh, we've introduced a budget whereby we have provided three-year stable, predictable funding for education. And it starts this year with a 3.5% increase, followed by uh, a 3.3% increase next year, and a 3.7% increase the year following. This is historic, and this will allow us to set our sights. Once you, once you have funding stability, you get to set your sights on everything else that matters in education. Now what's really exciting uh, with today's budget, from my perspective, is also the fact that inclusive education gets an increase of 22%. What's further more exciting is the fact that over the next three years, we'll spend a billion dollars, one billion dollars on capital investments to build new schools and to refurbish uh, existing schools. So our government has taken, I think, a very bold step by showing our commitment to public education 
and introducing the stable funding arrangement. Uh, my friends, I often, uh, I'm the product of public education. I mean, I, I'm the product of an education system that's quality and accessible. Um, and in a modern democracy, quality education, a quality accessible public education, I think, is a pillar of modern democracy as equivalent to the rule of law. Because if you don't have an accessible, quality public education system, you'll always have inequalities within a society. Our actions in this funding arrangement, I think, show our commitment to uh, the pillar of public education. Now, I can go into detail about budget, uh, and I can go in and start uh, challenging some of what my colleagues up here have said about the record on education, but both colleagues so far have said you need stable, predictable funding, and that was delivered today. Now, the next thing I want to briefly chat about is how education is changing overall. And we know Minister uh, Lukasik will be bringing forth changes to the Education Act. Education is changing fundamentally around the world. Our young people have access to information like never before. The role of teachers is evolving and changing from, from one where the teacher was the knower of all knowledge now to facilitators of learning in many respects. These are exciting times. And we have to ensure that we have legislation that allows the creativity and the passion in the classroom to really take shape. So that is what you can expect to take forth, uh, take shape with the new Education Act. Something I'm very passionate about is dual credit programming. Something I want to see changed in our society is no child in grade nine, or very few children in grade nine, question whether or not they're going on to high school. If we have our way, and if we're successful, my friends, after high school, no child will question whether or not they're going on to post-secondary. It will be a natural evolution for every student in Alberta. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is a software trainer for small business in Calgary and is a resident of Fexido Park. He grew up in Calgary, traveled across the country, moved back to Calgary, and graduated from the University of Calgary in 2004 with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. He lives an active lifestyle, enjoys going to the gym, playing various sports, and plans to run a marathon in 2011. Ladies and gentlemen, would you help me welcome the representative of the New Democratic Party in Alberta for Cal the Cal constituency of Calgary Klein, Mark Power. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I actually plan on running in 2012 now that I'm kind of a candidate in the election. I don't have the time to do my running as I, as I used to. It really is an honor uh, to speak to you tonight. Uh, and speaking in front of as many teachers, I'm afraid that you might have some red pens in your pocket and are going to judge my, my grammar, so I apologize in advance if I butcher anything. Um, <laughs> first of all, I want to thank my fellow panelists for coming out tonight. As we're all aware, it's today's budget day, so for people to make it down from Edmonton when they, I mean, I'll know how busy you really are, it's been a, quite the day. Um, yes, my name is Mark Power, and I'm happy, well, I'm happy to be here talking to you tonight. It frustrates me that we still have to be talking about public funding, because we live in the most prosperous province, in one of the most prosperous countries in the world, and the fact that we have to worry about class sizes and talk about public funding for private institutions is so beyond where we actually, you know, we should be so far beyond that. And we're not. And the reason we're not is it's a matter of priorities. You know, we've seen this government has been in power for 40 years, and I appreciate the sustainable government, the sustainable funding. You know, you've had 40 budgets, and here's your first one, so it's a good start. But you've had 40 of them before, so maybe hopefully this will be a process going forward that you'll actually continue on with. Um, but I'm running in Calgary Klein. It's a ride, and it's going to be named after Mr. Ralph Klein. He happens to be, you know, the man who sliced and diced our education system back in the 90s. He's the guy in a decade back, took away a lot of the teachers' rights to strike with Bill 12. And then, you know, we have, he's basically one of the people who have left us in the situation we are right now. And then and we signed this agreement. 
And then they reneged on it, the conservatives reneged on it, and uh, ultimately we've left our mm -hmm. school boards with structural deficits that they're trying to continually fight against. And we've basically left teachers and school boards trying to juggle to do the best they can in a system that's in inadequate. The NDP has, well, we, we believe that you really need to have three principles when looking at your education system. The first of them is that education is an inherent right of an Albertan. The second is that knowledge is power. So anytime you deny a student the opportunity to have power or knowledge, you're denying them the, the power to, to get past where they currently are. The third is that a teacher's workplace is the student's learning place. And so if you don't respect the teacher's ability to work in a place that has reasonable class sizes, and has professional development that, that is balanced and that have the kind of tools at their disposal that you never have to worry about paying massive fees to get books and to get bringing Kleenex and red pens and things that should never have to be worried about in our, in our, you know, in our education system. That makes the learning place better for a student. So I think when you need sustainable funding, you also need you know, a new government, or at least new representation. People who legitimately stand behind the rights of teachers to bargain, who stand, who when they sign an agreement, stand by it. Who promise to fund our public education system first, phasing out the, public, the private sector, phasing out charter schools, bringing them all together, breaking down the walls that divide up our students. So that's the kind of thing that keeps our students from enjoying the best possible public system. When we're paying hundreds of millions of dollars a year to support private education, that money should be directed to public education first, and then from there, we can absolutely work towards you know, allowing other choices in the system, but it should be something that's at the responsibility of the parents. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mark. Our fifth panelist yeah. uh, received his law degree in 1992 from the University of Alberta and has served for almost 20 years as an Alberta Crown Prosecutor and more recently in private practice. He has served on the board of Volunteer Calvary. He is married to his wife Erin, who is here this evening, and they raised four children together. Would you please help me welcome the representative of the Alberta Party and the candidate for Calvary Curry, Norm Kelly. Good evening, everyone, and a uh, uh, big uh, hearty thank you to all of you for organizing this event and for the, uh, the uh, people involved in making this all happen, the ATA, who are inviting me. Uh, it is a great honor and a privilege uh, to represent the Alberta Party uh, tonight at this forum and to give you a little taste of uh, who we are and, and what we're about. Um, being the, the, the sort of the newest political entity on, on the block, maybe I'll spend just a few moments talking about uh, the Alberta Party. We are a group of individuals that have come together because we believe in a vision, a vision of doing a better type of democracy, a better type of engagement with citizens, and that's really the heart of what we're about. And that's reflected in how we develop policy, and that's reflected in how we developed our education policy, and why it's an honor to come here tonight to speak to all of you a little bit about that. Um, at the outset, the Alberta Party Thank you. The Alberta Party is a big believer and a strong supporter of public education uh, in Alberta. Uh, I am a product of public education. My wife is a product of uh, public education. And you know what? We think we've done pretty good. And our children, we have four of them, three of them right now are school age, and they are all in public education. Uh, this is the truth is in the pudding. Uh, the proof is in the pudding, as it were, for the value that you place on something. All of our children are the future for all of us, and our children um, are, are no different for us. The overarching goal and the overarching theme for the Alberta Party is respect. There is seemingly a lack of uh, respect for the players in the education system at the grassroots level. One of the raison d'etre, one of the reasons we exist as a party, and individuals such as myself have come forward to represent this party is we strongly believe in engaged, active listening. And what we have done in terms of our policy creation is gone around this province for the last 18 months to two years and engaged people. 
all kinds of people from all walks of life, including teachers, to figure out what it is that are concerning you, what you want to see happen, and education is no different. Um, I would recommend you to the, uh, the policy framework that we have at our website, but let me hit a couple of highlights on this. The magic of education is in the teacher-student relationship. So it's where those supports need to be in place that the Alberta Party focuses as policy. Uh, where there are breakdowns, whether that be in money, whether that be in appropriate resources, whether that be in the relationships between uh, teachers and administrators, the boards, the politicians, the Alberta Party very much stands for the proposition that where those issues and breakdowns are, we want to be talking to you and figuring out where the issues are uh, and, and get rid of them. And some of these are very easy fixes. If it comes to uh, assessment aspects, if that's taking up all the time to delivering a quality education, then let's look at how we assess. If the question is we don't have enough resources in place, whether it's paraprofessionals, uh, where it's um, uh, teacher's aides uh, for uh, delivering quality education to, uh, to the majority of the classroom, or to all the classroom, excuse me, uh, we need to have those resources in place. Um, at the end of the day, it is about respect, it's about relationships, it's about active listening and delivering the appropriate resources to make education uh, the priority it needs to be and should be. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We're off to a good start. I would like to, while I'm getting ready here now, to ask the first three prepared questions. I'd also like to acknowledge a few other guests we have in the audience. Would you help me welcome uh, Wendy Beyer, who is the president of ATA Local 55. Wendy, would you stand so we can acknowledge you? We also have Jenny Regal, president of ATA Local 38. We also have the past president of the of CAPC, the uh, Council on Public Schools, Aaron Kelly, and the current president, Leslie Newton, ladies. So what we're going to do is I'll ask this question, and why don't we just have Manny, you go first, and the next question, Norm, and the next question, Kevin, and we'll just keep rotating throughout as we ask these questions. How does that sound? So the first question prepared by uh, the Action Committee is as follows. The ATA believes that students' learning conditions and teachers' working conditions are one and the same. How should the Alberta government guarantee sustainable, adequate, and predictable funding for education so that it will meet the needs of a growing and increasingly diverse student population. Now, just as a reminder, our timer has a sign. It says, one minute. When, and he's going to hold up and says, time is up. And after that, he will glare at you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you may want to share the microphone as well. All right, carry on. Well, thank you. Uh, look, we, uh, our premier's committed, and, and she talked about this very much in the leadership, to predictable, sustainable funding. Uh, it can't be, uh, you know, a battle every single year um, to, to, to know what the funding is going to be. So we've made that commitment, and today is that day. Uh, Premier Redford has been in, uh, has been Premier for about 100 days, and she's acted on this, and today's the day. We have a three-year commitment now for funding. That means this is how we're going to get off that roller coaster ride of uh, resource revenues. We've given a three-year commitment. Uh, I think it's a very strong commitment uh, towards public education and uh, I mean it, it goes up 3.5 percent this year, 3.3 percent next year, and 3.7 year percent the year following. In addition to that we've already got three years of, of capital projects lined up as well. So uh, in my opinion um, this is a very important issue and uh, it's an issue we've taken action on. Uh, for the Alberta Party, again, it boils down to uh, that act of listening piece. The sustainable, adequate funding comes down to a prioritization. A prioritization of what is a fundamental um, right in this province, which is public education that is properly funded. So a big part of that listening piece is rather than the top telling downwards, pushing down the message, whether it's ideologically driven, whether it's economic uh, parameters driven, it can't be that way. What it is, is where the rubber hits the pavement is in the operation side, where it's delivered. So listening to the people that are actually delivering the service, and that very much includes parents and teachers, uh, bringing it up as to what we're seeing, what we need, 
and then the people at the top making those fiscal decisions then saying, right, this is what you need, this is what we can deliver, and get it done. The Wild Rose Party also believes in diversifying our economy, not basing everything on oil and gas prices. So yeah, coming up with a sustainable, yeah. a sustainable funding formula, not necessarily tapped into what the oil and gas prices are today. We have to divers diversify our economy, and we can make savings out of government operations. We can cut maybe 30 to 34 percent of MLA pay increases that they gave themselves, and use some of that money in, back into the public education. We would like to put the money back at the local level as well, giving the local school boards, simplifying the whole the whole financial mess of, of how boards are funded, simplifying it, giving the boards enough money to run the entire division and let the boards make the decisions as to how it should be done locally, and that's where schools are placed as well, letting the boards decide and the local people, school councils, community organizations decide where the school should be going. I, once again, I do appreciate the concern of, I call it a uh, political deathbed conversion to the commitment to education. Uh, but uh, it, the NDP has always fought for sustained funding to our, to our education system. It's crucial. We also do support the, the idea of transferring over, uh, re-decentralizing re uh, the, the property tax back to the municipalities. Um, and, but the, government, the provincial government would, of course, make sure that there was a sustainable, overarching pay, payments to the education system, to the, to the local school board, so that they can be constantly aware of exactly how much they need to budget. Um, and we've also talked about, you know, when it comes to actually raising money, that our, we need to reevaluate our tax base. We need to make sure that uh, we're making fair uh, money from our royalties. We own that oil, and we should be making fair royalty money from it. We also believe that our co corporate rate needs to be looked at so we can have that money going forward that we never have to cut education again. Well, then he talked a lot about uh, what was in the budget. What he didn't talk about, what was not in the budget. No preschool, no uh, kindergarten, things that were agreed to in the Learning Commission. No elimination of school fees by parents. None of that stuff is touched in this budget. He spit out a bunch of numbers to you that sound impressive, but really at the end of the day, they're just numbers. And they have no idea, or they're not telling you, how they're going to pay for it. Okay, the Alberta Liberal Plan is fairly simple. We have a modest uh, tax increase on 10% of, of people uh, in our society to commit to predictable, sustainable funding. We've asked our corporations to put in two more percent to predict or to commit to predictable, sustainable funding. Otherwise, you're doing it one of two ways. You're either running deficits or, or spending it on our kids' future, selling oil and gas, uh, barrels of oil to pay today's bills. That's like a, a farmer selling off the family far, farm to pay today's bills. It's not predictable, it's sustainable, it's, sustainable. it's a recipe for disaster. Gentlemen, we're off and running. Our second question, class size and composition affects students, teachers, and the community at large. The Alberta Commission on Learning established guidelines for class sizes as follows. Junior kindergarten to grade 3, 17 students. Grades 4 to 6, 23 students. Grades 7 to 9, 25 students. And grades 10 to 12, 27 students. The ATA has urged the Department of Education to ensure completion of the class size initiative to monitor and report publicly on its progress. Class sizes in excess of these guidelines are commonplace and are compounded by increasing diversity of student needs in each class. Does your party support these targets and is it committed to funding them? We'll start this one off with Norm and just work our way down and around, please. Thank you very much. The Alberta Party is very much committed to uh, meeting uh, classroom size initiatives. Um, the classroom size is only one part of that issue. The other uh, big piece is the classroom composition. It's just very much recognized in the recent years that it's just become more and more difficult 
uh, to teach at the level that you want to teach at because the class sizes are at an unmanageable level and so is the composition. The, the resources need to be there. Uh, the numbers are absolutely important to that, but more importantly are the resources in the classroom so that you can actually do what you want to do, which is teach and get those lessons across and have that spark and that magic happen, which is the relationship between uh, the teacher and the learner, and that's so difficult to get to if you've got uh, so many people that you need to be uh, concerned with, and then the composition uh, with special needs and everything else that's going on uh, is almost uh, impossible to do the job that you want to do. So we're very much committed to that. And uh, that's our position. I guess the short answer to that question would be yes. The Wild Rose Party is dedicated to making sure that those class size compositions are met. Um, the, the current PC government seems to have a way of, of creating, almost creating crisis out of, uh, out of lack of funding and then coming in with a solution later on rather than and then being pushed to a point where okay we have sustainable funding that, that people have been talking about for years and years and years um, anyone that's in education know that the class sizes started off as a strong initiative and became guidelines and then those guidelines slowly got bigger and bigger and changed and changed composition as well the class uh, assessment of special needs students has been changing and one of the areas that we're looking at is in that composition of the class, special needs children do, should not be counting just as one person. If if they take the time of two people, well, then that's two people are the class size composition definitely. Absolutely, uh, class size is a huge issue. When you've got 30, 40 kids in your class and you're trying to pay individual attention to one of them, it's almost impossible. We really do need to look at the assessment. Um, one of the challenges is for those you know, the low average students that might not quite qualify for um, the extra special needs funding that comes along. I think we need to do a better job of, being, of, of funding that assessment so that you can make sure that the class is getting the kind of funding that it, the school are getting the funding that they need to support their kids. Um, we thoroughly believe that one of the crucial things that, that changes the success of our students in their class is the, is the size of their class. So it has to be the number one priority is to get those class number sizes down. We all have a favorite teacher. You can't, if you don't have a, you know, if you've got a class of 40, you can't identify the individual needs of each student and give them the, the care that they actually need. The Learning Commission re report regarding these class sizes and these class size initiative was signed in 2003 by this government. They have made no effort whatsoever to move in that direction. There is nothing in this budget that works on class size initiatives. Nothing in this budget that works on that class size. So I have no confidence in this government to move on that issue. They're basically uh, no plan. Open oil and gas wells to to uh, pump again, and public education can wait till that time when maybe this happens, maybe the the dollar does this, the the yen does that, and hopefully magically we'll be able to reduce class sizes. You can't do this without predictable, sustainable funding, and go to your public citizens and say education is worth funding. It's worth funding now and getting these uh, things necessary, junior kindergarten. Kindergarten, the elimination of public schools, the elimination of school fees, those are what's important now. And there's no plan in this budget to deal with this. Well, uh... Kent, I very much disagree. The fact of the matter is, since 2004, nearly $1.6 billion has been invested. Yeah, numbers are what get results, my friend. $1.6 billion have been invested in the class size initiative. We're committed to this. In this year's budget, an additional $5.7 million is being added to it, total of $232 million. Uh, and there's a big focus from the kindergarten to grade three level. That's when we feel that it has the most impact. Uh, we provide the funding and there's many school jurisdictions across the province that are meeting these targets and others that are not. Uh, so we provide the funding and local school authorities that are very empowered uh, are the ones that execute uh, the best 
way to reach this target. Um, and so this is, this is a initiative that uh, I think, quite frankly, some jurisdictions have put a lot of effort into and others have made a, a little less uh, effort. But the fact of the matter is, it's being funded uh, and the funding for it is going up this year. All right, gentlemen, good work. Question number three. Currently, Alberta government provides $250 million of public funds each year to fund private and charter schools. Alberta's teachers are concerned that private and charter schools create social segregation through exclusive admission practices and ultimately weaken public education. What is your party's vision for the role of charter schools and the amount of funding for private schools? Kevin, how would you like to lead off? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure in this room I want to lead off on this one, <laughs> but I will. Uh, the Wild Rose Party is in support of, uh, of private schools and charter schools. And the reason is, well, two reasons. First of all, the pie that is public education does not become smaller when private education is involved. The, the pie that has been sustaining public education has been increasing, and that with the increase of private schooling, that does not affect the public education pie. So it is, it is separate. Uh, the whole issue of, uh, of segregating society and so on, there are individual needs that are met in different schools, and I've been in education long enough to know that I can't teach everybody how I would like, to, I would like for them to learn, and that as an educator, we have to continue to learn. And I, <clears throat> at first, I wasn't sure about charter schools, but I've seen, I've seen them grow, and I've seen public education learn from charter schools. So it's a, it's a matter of choice for parents, and a matter of us learning from everybody. Well, <clears throat> I don't think a two-tier system works for health care, I don't think it works for education either. Um, the reality of the situation is that charter schools, people talk about market-based solutions and um, innovation and things like that. Innovation can and does happen on, in the public school system every day, especially you know, when our government uh, provided originally oh, AC, which was helped allow students you know, to have some more targeted funding and ch change the, the way that you teach individual students um, focused on their needs rather than to come out of the, the textbook. But we cut that. Well, we reinvested a little bit in there, but welcome back to you know 2010. You know we need to actually make a complete, and you know we have to make sure we have a complete devotion to our public education, the public education system first. Once we dedicate our, you know, get that functioning, then we can worry about having market choice. But when we have holes in our schools, we should be fixing those holes before we build new schools. And I think it's big, it's a big, big problem that you know the wild roads they're going to try to argue it works, but it doesn't work in the United States. It don't work here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this government uh, funds private schools to a more wealthy tune than any other province in Canada. That's a fact. They believe that this uh, somehow, this word wrapped up in choice, somehow helps our communities come together and educate our children. I think it separates and divides our children. It doesn't allow them to uh, live in a cohesive fashion, it doesn't allow them to uh, uh, bring people together. And uh, under the Alberta Liberals, we'll stop uh, funding private schools uh, right out. Uh, as for charter schools, well, uh, you can leave them at their 13 uh, that they have out there, but not another charter will be issued under an Alberta Liberal government. So our position is pretty clear. We see no value in it. We will use the $127 million that is currently funding our private schools to educate our children in a reasonable fashion. If people don't think that's good enough for their kid, pay for it themselves. Do not ask the public first to pay for your private religious or religious education. That will not happen. Uh, well, it's it will be no surprise to you folks that, yes, we believe in choice and education. Yes, we believe in uh, uh, rights for folks to put their children in private schools or in charter schools. And uh, I, I'm a public school boy. 
Uh, I'm a strong believer of, of the public system. I love the public system. Uh, and I do not believe that having a, a private school system or allowing innovation in the public system through charter schools uh, in any way hinders public schools. At the end of the day, my friends, if we're going to succeed and continue to have a world-class education system, then at some point in education, we'll have to start bringing down the temperature and realize that all methods of education in this province are still working towards the same goal. And that's ensuring Alberta students have the best opportunities to reach their greatest potential, reach everything they can be. And, um, and it's a matter of family and personal choice, whether or not that be public, private, or uh, public charter. Thank you. Uh, this is also a very timely question. The Alberta policy position on this is that we have to recognize the variations that are already out there. Uh, we are not uh, going to allow public money to be going to private schools if they are practicing exclusionary principles and policies. So that would be an examination. We're not standing for that whatsoever. What we have to recognize, though, is that there are some very innovative private schools out there that are not profit-oriented. There are not-for-profit societies that are private schools delivering much needed for types of education for parents who choose that for their children. And I agree with some of the other panelists up here that choice is one of the fundamental hallmarks of a top-notch, top-tier education system. Because let's face it, frankly, parents want it, parents are expecting it, and they're demanding it. Uh, we also agree that if there are some exclusionary practices going on, then the public funding shouldn't be there. It certainly shouldn't be there at the level that it is right now. But charter schools are here, they have been innovative, and they've been very successful. Public CB has charter schools as well, and they have their place in the system. Thank you. Good job. Ladies and gentlemen, this is starting to get you live written text messages with questions. Make sure you're writing out for the setting up here. We have this elaborate volunteer system to get them up here in a way that I can actually read. Our fourth question. Teacher workload continues to increase. We're losing first-year teachers at an alarming rate. Teachers are expected to work on personal lesson plans, introduction of new technologies, in addition to report cards, lesson planning, extracurricular activities, etc. We don't even have time to make student-teacher connections. How would your party address the issue of increasing teacher workload and burnout? Well, first of all, making sure you don't have 30 students in your class all the time would be a good start when you don't have to mark 30 exams and 30, you know, papers and all that kind of stuff. It makes it a little bit easier for you to start. Um, I think, of course, we need to make sure that uh, we have some extra, te you know, technology and extra resources in your, in your, uh, on, at your disposal at all times. But the biggest, in my you know, the biggest thing I think you can give a teacher is, is a little bit of free time to actually pay attention to their individual students on a, on a personal level, which has to be done by lowering your class sizes. Well, let me start by saying that in my view, uh, uh, public teachers have never been overpaid. It starts by paying them a decent wage for a decent day's work, and why wouldn't you? They, they deserve to take part. If uh, other people in the community are doing well, they deserve to take well. And uh, the, I, I, would, I would stand by that principle. But if you're looking at classroom dynamics, I think uh, the, the survey I saw on the ATA website said, said teachers are working 56 hours a week. Roughly 16 of those are in front of the classroom. And they're getting uh, diet, bound down in assignable time and the like but really their professional skills are better used in the classroom where they're able to free up their, uh, their skills to teach kids what they're passionate about. I think there's gotta become a true partnership between uh, the, ATA, the, the ATA and the teachers and the government. Move into uh, something where we're, we're sharing ideas, where we're learning back pra best practices. Not teaching to a test. Let's get rid of those uh, uh, those, sticks and those other tests that are are making people uh, teach to a test. Let's make it a real partnership. Um, you know, Alberta teachers, I think, are amongst the best in the world. Not I think, I know. Uh, and uh, it's important to compensate them well. It's important to, 
uh, to ensure that teachers uh, feel connected to their occupation, uh, to the students, and to the role, the very important role they play in our society. Uh, and that's by giving uh, teachers respect as a society. I think uh, the role of a teacher in, a, in our society overall, uh, we need to further promote. I mean, it's, it's fundamentally important that uh, our teachers are become some of the most valued members of our society. Yeah? So that's, that's something that I want to say at a societal level. Now, with respect to specific classroom activities, um, something that I, I think is very innovative is, is in the increased funding for inclusive education, where local schools can make determinations to see what resources they can better attribute to what classrooms to alleviate pressures on specific teachers and make it better for individual students. The hallmark, and the answer really for this comes down to, again, some of the fundamental principles that we believe in, active listening and engaging with teachers, and then taking the action steps that are required once you get that information. Uh, I've recently read the report that uh, the AT put out, uh, and uh, it's, it's work intensification is, is a massive problem. So how do you deal with that? These are relatively straightforward fixes. Uh, when I worked at the Department of Justice uh, 20 years ago, we were in a situation where we were expected to be in court every single day running multiple trials. Right. So we started indicating to the administrators, to the senior lawyers in the department, this is completely unsustainable. Does this sound familiar? The respect comes in when those people are listening and the supports and resources are put in place. That's what needs to happen here. Listening, active engagement, and then paying attention and taking the action steps required after that. So if there's, uh, the wages are there, it can be improved, it almost can be, but that's not the big issue, I don't think. I think the issue here is the respect of the professionals in the classroom doing their job and the supports that need to be in place to, for them to do that. I think the kind of the crux of the problem is workload, and we all know that, that it's increasing every day. Um, I, I went to summer conference a couple of years ago, and the, a psychologist was was explaining to it to all of us how what what's happened over the years is we've become boiled frogs. When uh, when we first went into the water, and I'm a cusper, I'm a I'm a baby boomer cusper, just at the edge there, so I'm not quite a baby boomer, but um, the baby boomers had this this habit of working really, really hard. And so the teachers, we jumped into the water when it was cool, but over the last five, 10 years, all the new initiatives put out by the government have increased and that water has been boiled and hot. And we've stayed in the water the whole time. We're asking young kids to come and jump into the hot water and they're afraid to. And I, I, I see why, you know, that we're, we're taking on a lot of things. What we need to do is just get back to the simple basic skills of best practices. We know what works in the classrooms. Let us work with them. Let us work with the ATA. We want to, the Wild Rose wants to work with the educational experts, which is everyone in this room and the ATA, and get back to the best practices. Good job. Next question from the audience. What is your party stance on provincial achievement tests? as well as the current 50% weighting of diploma exams? Well, first off, we uh, eliminate uh, grade three and six uh, tests immediately. We'd look at uh, eliminating uh, uh, grade nine. And uh, when you're looking at weighting uh, tests at a 50% level, that's far too high. Teachers know how their students are doing and are adequately prepared at their university courses and their and now five-year uh, program to adequately assess how their students and communicate those ideas to their students. I think the idea of the uh, provincial uh, achievement test has run its course. We have to free up teachers to uh, inspire kids to learn what they want to learn. That's the skill that uh, that kids need out there. It's not uh, teaching to a test. It's not. Uh, cramming things down their throat. It's allowing them to learn what they want to learn and having teachers use their skills to creatively reach these kids. And the current system does not allow that. Uh, 
Minister Lukasik, uh, with direction from Premier Redford, is currently reviewing um, uh, tests for grade threes and sixes. And we're looking at, uh, thank you, sir. And again, you know, uh, we're, we're reviewing this, evaluating this, because the fact of the matter is you don't want to stress children out for these tests, but at the same time, you need mechanisms to ensure that uh, the curriculum that we are in fact teaching is in fact doing what it needs to do. Uh, so uh, I would say right now, uh, government is very open to seeing uh, best practices with respect to testing not just students, uh, but in fact uh, our curriculum and our educational outcomes. So uh, it's on the table, it's being evaluated right now. For the Alberta Party, using students as uh, data collection guinea pigs is just an untenable proposition. The Alberta Party is a proposition. The PATs at grade three and grade six, grade six level immediately eliminated. The diploma exams. Uh, I was one of the unfortunate crew in 1985 when I graduated from high school. Those had been phased out the generation before. Well, guess what? They came back to my graduation, and I can tell you, the human cost, I still have scar for the test of exams. Way too high. The waiting has got to go down. It's just causing our high school students absolute nightmares and stress. It's completely unfair and unnecessary. And that's our position. Well, that's too bad because I skipped through there three years before, and I didn't have to write. <laughs> Uh, Wild Rose Party, uh, our position is that we would immediately get rid of the grade three and grade six PATs. Teachers know how to how, how to assess our children, um, and my my phrase has always been: is it accountability or ability that counts? And we know the ability of our children. We know how to best assess that. And at the high school level, we we would definitely look at reducing the weight, the 50-50. My my children have gone through that, and it's difficult, difficult. Um, certainly the teachers understand what the level of the student is at and the universities. It, it does our grade 12 students a disservice to have them writing one test that makes 50% of their mark and try and use that as university entrance. So we're doing our children a disservice. Who knew on that? Uh, you know testing that the Wild Rose and the NDP would actually have a similar position. It's probably one of the only time it's only career at some point. <laughs> uh, absolutely. We think that the idea of uh, testing in grade three and six, it adds extra stress to the teachers, it adds extra stress to the students. Stuff, it's not, we need to spend more time on di diagnostics on kids who actually need, need help. So you be focusing on, you know, special needs first and then from there, yes, the teachers can do a good job of assessing. I happen to be the last person who did a diploma exam on this stage. Myself and my meet were close, but he's one year older than I am. So uh, I know what it's like to go through the stress of writing a diploma exam. It is not fun. You need it. If you get a headache, you get sick, whatever, you can really punish yourself for the long haul. And if you're not good at multiple choice exams, because we're moving towards those, and I'm not, I won't lie, I can write an essay like nobody's business, but when it comes to a four answer option, I do really poorly. I don't think that's a good judge on exactly how a student, how good of a student is, a punishment on them if they make a mistake. Thank you. I was wondering, in the student of transparency, if we shouldn't ask all of you to release your grade 12 math. <laughs> 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 Gentlemen, the government is pleased about the one billion promise for new schools and maintenance. The deferred maintenance backlog for the CBE alone is greater than $800 million. What plan should school boards make for housing students into the future when the buildings at the current funding rate will be so far gone that they'll need to be replaced before new buildings can be even built? Uh, well, look, at, at present there's 45 new schools being constructed and 31 major construction projects taking place on existing schools. Um, Part of our government's commitment in the last few years um, to infrastructure spending has been for this very reason. We need to ensure that we are building the Alberta we need for tomorrow. So while other jurisdictions 
quite frankly spend about half of what we spend on infrastructure spending. And so and this is something where you know, our friends in the Wild Rose often say, cut your infrastructure spending. So our, my question to them is, which of these school projects do you not want to move forth? We're spending more, about 38% more than virtually every Canadian province uh, on infrastructure capital spending. Uh, and quite frankly, Alberta's growth needs this. Uh, this is something that we're going to continue to do. Um, and this is all, we're spending this money for money that we've saved in the su sustainability account. So uh, we're making this investment, or we're going to continue to make this investment. But quite frankly, we're growing at a rate where, uh, my time's up. <laughs> That, that is truly a, a timely question and, of course, exceedingly difficult to give any pat answer for. The reality is, is that it's a travesty that has not been allowed to occur. We all recognize that. Uh, moving forward, uh, the Alberta Party's uh, position would be we need to set aside a fund specifically for maintenance. And that's just be, it just has to be found along with the, uh, the priority of, of education uh, as an overall aspect of getting the children educated. Part of that and part of offering supports is making sure that the, the infrastructure needs that are ongoing and moving into the future for a burgeoning province, those have to be met by its own separate fund, but so too does the uh, deplorable conditions of some of our schools, and it has to be addressed, and money has to be found, whether it's uh, one-time expenditures or uh, money from general revenues dedicated to this, it has to be a specific fund just for that. Well, I'm glad that you listen to the Wild Rose Party every now and then. I mean, that, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> um, well, I, I think, there's, again, there's a couple issues. One of them is the, the politicizing of where schools go. And I, again, I think it comes back to local decision-making is always best, rather than decisions made in Edmonton. And what has happened the last couple of years is the decisions have been made in Edmonton, and it's, they've gone into certain areas maybe not necessarily where they need to go. I know down in the southeast there's communities with those schools and their children have to get bused two communities over because the ones in between are all full. So if, if we could simplify the, the funding so that school boards were given all the plan operations and maintenance and everything into a simpler strategy rather than breaking it all down because plan operations and maintenance has been frozen for the last couple of years and it's another indication of what the what the PCs have done lately, they create a crisis and then they come up with a solution later. So rather than creating the crisis, let's get the sustainable funding to the boards and let them make the decisions of where the schools can go. I think one of the solutions to saving money when it comes to building schools is actually stop the P3 model. I think the P3 model, and there's studies done saying that for every two schools you can build, in, two schools built, no sorry, for two schools you build the P3, you can build an extra one for in the public school model with the traditional model of uh, paying for them. So I think it's really important that we do look at the way we're actually building our schools and make sure that they're built in a way that's, of course, uh, the the most. Well, at least expensive, obviously. And I think the public traditional method of spending is the best way to do it. We also need to stop closing our schools. You know, urban schools right now are getting hit pretty hard by the way that the funding uh, formula is with our, for our urban schools. So the more we can keep our existing schools in order, the better. I think. So I think that, in my opinion, it, it really does depend a lot on how we decide to, that we're going to spend the, spend our money, and it's got to be done in a way that's with the public uh, financing model. Well, Mammy didn't tell you why we're having to spend 38% more than any other province, because we didn't put a dime into infrastructure spending or school building for 15 years, from 1993 to 2008. So is it any wonder why we're now playing catch-up, because of the rock-headed moves of former PC governments? It's pretty as easy as that. You know, but if we look at infrastructure spending, we can all, we can all say we need a commitment to it from society. Okay, we have a plan that says public education is important. Building schools is important. Uh, community building is important. Okay, it has to come down to commitment from you, the taxpayer. Okay, we can continue to dance around this issue, but it, how do you get predictable, sustainable funding 
when you have a flat tax system that allows a person making a million dollars pay the same rate of a tax as a man making 50 bucks. There's no way that leads to any equality of opportunity or any fairness in a taxation system. Until that happens, there will be no predictable, sustainable funding. Gentlemen, our next question. The government has tabled a budget that provides predictable funding, however, the increase to the basic instructional grant of 1% this year is at least 1.5% lower than the current inflation rate. Given basic grant increases totaling only 5% over the next three years, how can school boards provide appropriate educational services to a growing student population? Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky me that I had to address the hard numbers question right off the bat uh, and first up. So this is a very timely question. The budget just came out. Uh, I'm not a numbers cruncher and um, so I don't have uh, uh, the one billion dollar uh, comment that uh, has come up here before. Obviously again it comes down to this very fundamental basic premise. Prioritization and, and uh, respect to what education is and what it does. Education investment is exactly that. It's an investment not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it makes economic sense long term. So if we are in a situation where we throw up a number and the number is six, you know, again, one view, it doesn't matter what that number is. What matters is at the end of the day, it's sustainable and adequate. And if it's neither, then it needs to be more. And that prioritization has to come in. And the Alberta Party is committed to that. Yeah, it, it is a timely question, but unfortunately, we some of the numbers that you guys just gave there, I, I'm not sure where they came from. I haven't had time. I, I drove for the last two hours. I wanted to see some of the budget being presented, but I haven't, haven't uh, heard it. I haven't seen any numbers just from what we hear up here tonight. So the one, one and a half percent, I, I'm not sure. That's the first I've actually heard of it. Um, one of the things that the Wild Rose Party would certainly want to look at is inflation plus population growth. That's, that's the minimum. So when you're talking about fu funding and sustainable funding, that's the minimum where you go and then you start increasing from there. That at least will cover population, and, or sorry, inflation, one or one and a half percent. I'm not sure where that number comes from or that's a budget number. It, it's hard to say at this point. Yeah, I am also not necessarily an expert on the numbers right now. I work full time and I just came here straight from work, so I, I got kind of the brief idea of exactly what the budget represented. I didn't get all the exact details, but it does bother me that everything I seem to hear from this government is focused on just keeping the bare minimum. So 3.3, 3.5, 3.7, that's all around you know, the rate of inflation, whereas you know, sometimes you also have to account for exactly that population growth. You need to account for um, possibly even increasing beyond inflation. It's always, it's, we need to really do, we do really need to look at the way we formulate how we're gonna start funding our students. We may have to, I think the NDP does recommend looking towards more of a, I think giving more discretion to the local school boards to make a decision on, on what they need in order, and rather than going by the per, per pupils uh, formula. Well, Brian, taking uh, what you just said at face value, it sounds like the numbers are a sham, what we've heard here tonight. How, do you, uh, how are you going to get uh, teacher classroom ratios down when the, the numbers you just said, whoever the mathematician was in the room, has just proven that it's an impossibility. Okay, this is not a commitment despite uh, the numbers we've here, heard here tonight. When you break through the BS, really, uh, is there a commitment to education? You ask that yourself. Uh, I'm assuming uh, uh, I've, I've talked to some teachers uh, tonight uh, in the professional organization who, is, who are saying openly to me that they believe they left to let teachers go this year as a result of this budget. So if that's predictable, sustainable funding, well, I, I guess that uh, you guys be the judge. You know, the, uh, 
the very first act our Premier uh, undertook after uh, winning the, the leadership of our party and becoming Premier was to restore the $107 million in educational funding. Uh, that's a that's that's a commitment to education uh, that is unparalleled. And now um, there's some parts of the education budget that may be going up 1%, and there's other parts that are going up 22% in the case of in inclusive education. Um, there's, a, there's a, you know, I, I spoke about our capital grants earlier, our commitment to continue to build the schools we need. Uh, we have other, other uh, grant funding like the Equity of Opportunity Grant Program, um, which is allocated in three different areas. So overall, funding for education is going up. I mean, we, we spend, I believe, $34 million every single day into public education, and that's Every single penny of that is a wise investment in the future of our province. You know, I'm going to acknowledge that was a pretty hard question, so here's a thought. Why don't I give you the answer and then you tell me what the question is? <laughs> All right. How will you ensure that children with special needs will continue to receive appropriate funding and care? Well, and again, th this is one of the areas that, uh, as an educator, has been huge, a huge frustration because the, the crisis has been created again um, because there has been no increase in funding in special education, at least for the last three years, maybe four years, because it's been review after review after review. Yes, another review. The, uh, and I'm not sure everybody always understands how special education is funded, right? It, it, it's a number of students, special needs students, that it used to be a three-year rolling average, and then you knew how many special needs students you had, and then you were funded so much per child. The number of students was frozen three years ago, and the, the amount per child was frozen three years ago. And costs have increased dramatically in the last three years, we know that. So the crisis has been created. If they had maintained what was happening, and with uh, just taking the average of the number of students so that the funding was actually following the students, it would be adequate right now. But we have to get back to where we can find, fund the students that are needed in the classroom. Excellent. As a, cool, a study that was done just a few years ago actually showed that in Ontario, uh, you actually get you upwards of $5,000 more per student uh, with, with severe special needs. And I think one of the points that the, the, our Wild Rose can actually, but I think it's really uh, valid previously, was that it would be nice if we had a two for one credit for, for special needs students in a class. I think that's something that, you know, the teacher needs to be freed up to give the, the, the student the attention they need. But also, it's important that the, the diagnostic testing is done. Teachers shouldn't be begging to be able to receive this funding. They should, that fund, they need to be tested so that they can make sure that everyone who needs the, the special attention is getting it. And if you're if you happen to be just one step above being officially considered has special needs, then and that's a huge uh, strain on the teachers. And, and so it's really important that as a, as a, as a province we really do a better job of actually doing the diagnostic testing. Well, again, I think that speaks volumes about this government's commitment to education. We've had special needs budgets frozen since uh, 2008. I'm sure we'll see an announcement uh, just in time for the election that says everything is restored. But let's, let's evaluate that. That's, uh, that's uh, teachers who have been put in a difficult uh, situation. But the, the real tragedy, the tragedy is children getting an opportunity to do the best they can. Not only has that been funded for the people who are already disabled, but that, that disabled population, the special needs population, has continued to grow over the last four years. And that leads a significant deficit, deficit in terms of what we're able to do in our classrooms. We have to rectify that situation and, and recognize that a, a properly funded education system can provide all the choice right within that pop properly funded public education system 
and can allow the kids to learn in whatever situation they find themselves in. Something that I've spoken about a couple times tonight is, is uh, a $68 million, 22% increase to inclusive education. And that means, I mean, this is, this is uh, a first step to implement a new funding model that supports inclusive practices in schools, where a school makes a decision on uh, what resources are best allocated to what student. Um, so if a school determines that they're more need of a specific, um, uh, specific professional, professionals on staff like a, a speech therapist and so on. That's funding that the school um, can allocate for that specific individual. This is the sort of local uh, empowered model that we need. An empowered model of funding where people have the ability to respond to the unique needs of a unique community. There's a fundamental flaw in the del delivery model of education in this province, and the Alberta Party would address that uh, immediately. And this question goes right to the heart of that. Uh, rather than uh, being a system which exists now of top-down, where money is doled out with no thought as to what's actually required in the classroom to support the learning there, and then we throw up the number of 34 million, 50 million, but it has no basis in reality in the sense that all of the responsibility is downloaded onto school boards. What needs to happen is a grassroots up. You people who are delivering the, the, the services and delivering this top-notch education, you see the people that you need, the, the funds that you need for the people in your classroom. That goes up the chain to the school boards, and the school boards makes the, the responsible ask. So it has to be inverted from what it is now. And it's that listening and that level of analysis that the Alberta Party would bring to this problem so at the end of the day, we get the supports that are needed to do the proper teaching in the classrooms. All right, our next question. Given that the large increases in the student immigrant population in the public education system, what does your party plan to do to meet the educational needs of these newcomers to Canada? Well, actually, we have fairly, I would say, pathetic history on supporting our students who, have, who need ESL training. Uh, if you compare us to, for example, Ontario, we basically pay, you know, we pay $1,000 a year per student who needs ESL, um, over upwards of up to seven years, but usually it ends up around three. And in, in, in Ontario, they basically pay out about 8000 over four years, and they basically make a sliding scale, so after the first year you get a certain amount, and then a little bit less and a little bit less until they assume that the student is closer to being comfortable in, in the language. So I think it's really important that we do, first of all, fund our, our teachers who have a, a significant DSL population, but also beyond that, you also need to make sure that there's more targeted uh, teaching. More, you push towards more innovation, towards teaching students who have ESL needs, trying to connect with them on a level that is is a little bit more targeted towards their individual needs because it's not they're not just people who have ESL students have specific needs and they need to be targeted that way. I'm glad my bro friend brought up Ontario and the statistics they're showing there on how uh, ESL students need to be supportive. We uh, we're going to be largely relying on. Uh, on uh, people coming from out of, out of this country to uh, fulfill our, our workforce and, and clearly uh, ESL funding needs to be recognized uh, and uh, obviously ramped up if we're going to have these people working and contributing and their families uh, getting uh, the best paying opportunities they, they can going forward. Uh, if you look at the statistics of people uh, who don't get ESL help, who come here after grade uh, uh, six. It's shattering that uh, the limits we're putting on them by the lack of ESL funding. I'd say we adopt uh, the Ontario model and uh, let's get on with it. Let's recognize that the face of Alberta is changing and let's properly fund teachers and properly fund ESL to fully recognize those kids' potential. They shouldn't just be coming here to uh, uh, work in our oil sands. They should be coming here to take part in our daily fabric of our lives. You know, I, I know a, a heck of a lot of people, including family and friends, that 
that have immigrated to Canada that uh, for some uh, the transition into a new language and a new culture was a lot simpler than others. Uh, I myself, I mean, I, I was born and raised in Canada, but uh, we spoke Punjabi at home, uh, more than English. And so uh, there were some simple things that I noticed uh, work when it comes to the success of ESL students. One is belonging and commit and belonging and connection to community, to school, and to peers. Um, and some of you may say, well, you're not talking about the funding. But this is incredibly important because I, before being elected, I worked a lot with, with at-risk youth, especially young people from uh, new immigrant homes. The lack of being able to connect with peers in school and being able to connect with uh, those that perhaps um, were used to a different culture, I think, was one of the fundamental reasons why I saw so many young people get disengaged from their education. And once again, I see that beautiful sign. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that the Alberta Party is immediately bringing to answer this question is to recognize a couple of key components. Uh, One would be it is tantamount to ridiculous that for this particular population that the teachers oftentimes, and I, I was incredulous when I first heard this, that are going to be, by the way, you're the ESL teacher now. Go to it, here's the manual, figure it out. So it supports, again, a respect for our teachers in the classroom so that when there's a, an ESL population that needs the training or needs that education, uh, specialized service, that the teachers have the proper training to perform that and do it adequately. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, it's a mugs game and you're paying lip service to what's needed. Uh, the other aspect is to recognize, and adopt a comment from my friend across the way, here that for some it's an easier transition than others and so one easy part of that is to increase the funding for high school eligibility and we can do about that as well. So those are a couple of key points to that. Um, ESL and, and this isn't just a, a, a Calgary issue or an Edmonton issue, the rural, rural districts are seeing quite an increase in, in immigrants moving in as well, Filipinos and uh, uh, all sorts of nationalities. So it, it is a province-wide issue. We're seeing more and more people immigrating into Alberta. And again, what ha happened last year was ESL funding state, but enhanced ESL funding was cut by the government. So there, there's their priority in ESL. Um, part of what we would look at, again, is the class composition. Not only in special needs students, but if we have ESL or ELL students in, in the classroom, that would be part of the classroom composition makeup. So if you have more students, then your class size composition should be smaller so that you can get around and work with those students. Another component, a little bit of outside of education, is adult education. And simplifying the structure so that we don't have to go grant writing and grant writing. I work in a couple small towns in Coldale and Tabor, and the communities have to write grants in order to get any adult education for the parents of these people as well. You know, in the past year and a half, I've been seeing uh, six debates at, at the, both the civic and provincial level. And I have to say, we have a very fine quality of uh, participant here this evening. We're getting excellent <laughs> We have three questions remaining. To our next panelist, if money has been invested in class size, why do I have 30 grade six students in my classroom? Well, one thing is, is obvious is that it hasn't been invested. We haven't made a commitment to uh, public education. And you know, we, we can all dance around the issues up here, here, here people, but you know, let's say there's some significant divergences in the parties here. The wild roses are going to cut and they're going to make your education system better. Well, good luck. Okay, the Alberta Party has said that there's more than enough revenue to go around uh, uh, in this province to make education better. Well, good luck. The Tories even sell, admittedly in their budget allude to the fact that there may be a revenue problem, but they're not going to tell you before the election because they're... Uh, they're going to be happy where they are. They're going to do it happy. We're the only ones being honest with you people. We're going to get rid of the flat tax system that allows society to contribute fairly. 
a fair share for educational resources from our wealthiest people. Okay, that's all we're asking. A fair, fair, uh, fair way to do things. We're going to ask our corporations to pay a little more. Is, uh, you know, in, in defense to our government, the reason we spend more is because Alberta is more expensive. Okay, we're competing against the oil and gas industry, so we need to do these things today and for tomorrow. Well, uh, thanks for that, Ken. <laughs> Look, uh, my friends, the way education is set up in Alberta, is we have a local authority. And so there's some school jurisdictions around the province that get closer to, uh, to the targets than others. This is a question, when I was not a minister, I was a private member, that I, I asked repeatedly, uh, in the Alberta legislature. Why are some jurisdictions getting closer to the targets than others? And so my question is, why are local citizens not asking specific school boards this very question? Uh, the province of Alberta funds education. We fund education in various envelopes, and school authorities, school boards, are the ones that uh, receive funding in those envelopes, uh, but don't always spend funding in those very envelopes because we've given them local autonomy. So uh, some have, have done uh, better at this than others, but it's a question of local decision making. Um, and but the bottom line that all of us can agree on is these are targets and commitments we're all committed to and we'll continue to pursue. There is obviously a disconnect in the system. Um, I said before that it strikes the Alberta Party that there's an inverse in the appropriate and proper relationship in terms of the connection of funding, what's needed in the classroom. So my friend is, is right that there's a downloading of monies, but they stop and then say that should be adequate. But the reality is that when you download an arbitrary number that's not connected to the actual needs of the classroom, it doesn't mean anything. All it then is a splash of here's the number. What has to happen is that whatever monies are put into the system, and believe you me, the Alberta Party will be fiscally responsible on this, is that it has to make its way to the classroom. It's not a question of simply saying here's the number. It's the question of the number is generated by the needs of the classroom. And that's where the connection comes in. Thank you for that, because um, I, I guess part of the question really evolves around what is investment? Is it just dollars, or is it people? And I think what we're looking at is people. We need to have people in the classroom, and let's find out what the dollar amount is going to be after, and, and make sure that that's okay. Um, I'm not sure why I'm answering the question, because I think Kent tried to answer for everybody to begin with. <laughs> well, close, but not quite. Um, and I also noticed why they cut off the, the microphones in the, in the house when you guys were talking. And here you just keep going and going and going. <laughs> but I think um, part of the problem is that we're, we're seeing 30 plus students in the classroom province-wide. It's not one district or another. It is province-wide, it's urban, it's rural, it's everywhere. We're having the same problems because the funding is just not coming down to the school level, even though it's maybe targeted, but Every division, whether or not they're spending all of their money or saving some, the class sizes are still too big because the investment is tied up in money instead of looking at people in the classroom. We're worried about people in the classroom. I, I noticed that Ken didn't uh, mention the Alberta MVP. I'm not offended. I think it's just because they photocopied our education <laughs> Conservatives have treated education like they start, they start a fire. In one hand, they've got water. In the other hand, they've got a gas can. And then at random times, they throw gas on it. And then, around, and then they decide that they're going to be the saviors and then pour water on it. So basically, you're in a constant situation where you've got a little carrot in front of you, and it, it's, you just never know when this carrot's going to go away. And the reality is we essentially do need absolutely continue along with sustainable capital funding, sustainable uh, 
funding for an entire education system. I think it's a, you know, so, uh, in the in the situation, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't come down to uh, it doesn't come down to a lot of the schools. But the reality of the situation was it was in the we've been dealing with cutbacks since the '90s, and they don't just things don't just bounce right back. We have to make sure that we do continue along. And I believe that if we continue to have sustainable education funding, we will get ourselves out of the, the huge class sizes. I'm a little confused, Mark. You said that you and Wild Rose agree, and now Kent is copying you, so therefore the Wild Rose and Liberal are the same. That's what I. That's all. Let's all hold hands and sing together, ladies and gentlemen. To our next panelist, does your party support full day kindergarten, and how would you fund it? Our present infrastructure barely supports half day programs. Where would you put full day students? <laughs> Those are all excellent questions. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, I mean, Premier Redford has uh, spoken very, very strongly on full, full day kindergarten. And one of the things that Minister Lukasik is looking at right now are, are those very questions that you've just asked. Um, I personally am a huge supporter of full day kindergarten. Uh, obviously, it has. Uh, it has challenges with respect to the actual infrastructure, the actual physical space needed, the number of teachers needed. Uh, and so those are questions that uh, Minister Lokazic is, is currently looking at uh, um, and uh, shall report back in, in, in due time. Um, early learning, early learning is something, is something that so fundamentally determines success of our children. Uh, and something that I think we need to shift our culture on, and especially for, for ESL and, and, and new immigrant families, is that connection to early learning. For example, I personally, uh, I never had anybody read to me, uh, let alone try to teach me the alphabet before I got into kindergarten. Good looking guy. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm going to be guilty of that as well. Uh, this, this is an example. We don't have the Alberta Party doesn't have a particular policy on this. But the uh, the way that would come about, though, is exactly the hallmark of what the party stands for. Is that uh, we are engaged with the last two years in what we call big listens, that active, uh, engaged, honest listening to what Albertans want, particularly the ones that are in the delivery system. In this case of, of uh, education, um, there is no doubt that this could be a great program. There's no doubt that early child care initiatives are something that the Alberta Party believes very strongly in. The, uh, the provision of uh, good quality services and good quality um, uh, training and good quality educational opportunities from a very early age uh, predicts very well for future success. So the full day child care, excuse me, full day kindergarten translates very well with what the Alberta Party has in place for early child care development or early child development. So we listen to what people have to say. The Wild Rose uh, is also in favor of full day kindergarten. Um, however, we also want to be flexible. And that means, um, for example, in the school that I'm currently at, we have, uh, because of rural and kids being bused in, we have Monday, Wednesday, full day kindergartens, and then it alternates to Tuesday, Thursday, so it's not a morning or an afternoon. So they're there full day. And we see some of the kids can handle it and some of the kids cannot. A full day is just too much for some kids. My own children, she went to a kindergarten in the morning, came home and slept for two hours in the afternoon. There's no <laughs> way she could have handled full day kindergarten. My second child could have. She was an energetic go-getter, you couldn't, couldn't track her down. Um, so we do support full day kindergarten. We see the, the learning benefits from it uh, and, and supporting and looking at pre-kindergarten. But we also want to be flexible. We don't want to force everybody into full day kindergarten when children are just not prepared for it. The MEP absolutely supports mandatory full day kindergarten, also half a junior kindergarten. Uh, there's a study done just a few years back which showed that every dollar you spend on kindergarten gives you four to five dollars in return. You can't get much better rate of return than that. And so if you're worried about the, the economic 
undertones of spending on kindergarten, when you get that kind of money back, you won't have to worry. It takes, it's proven that you've basically given kids a chance in help giving them up, uh, hands up in terms of keeping them out of the justice system, just transitioning them into the, to the education system as a whole is a tremendous benefit. Not to mention that for the, for the kids, of the family of the kids, it gives the parents a chance to go out and work and go out and actually uh, upgrade their education if they need to. So hopefully it can help actually s support the kids in terms of their economics. So they can actually have some money um, so in the, in the grand scheme of things, there's a, it's a win-win in kindergarten. It pays off in the long run. It needs to be done. And there's no reason it should. We studied it. We studied it. Our, 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 our government is great at studying, but really bad when it comes to doing tests. They seem never to show up to do anything on the, the stuff they study over and over again. <laughs> well, it'll probably come as no surprise that uh, Minister Lukasik will now be the sixth Minister of Education to study uh, full day kindergarten. So uh, the studying's been done. The proof's out there that uh, our society would greatly benefit from uh, both uh, junior kindergarten and kindergarten. And delaying this further sets our society back further, does not give our kids the opportunity to do things. And if we believe this is a societal commitment, then let's uh, get rid of the uh, flat tax. Okay, that allows a millionaire to pay the same uh, uh, rate of tax as a person making $40,000. And let's get on to getting them contributing to allow us to do these things that will move society forward. We're being honest with you here. The, the Wild Rose thinks they can cut $5 billion from the budget and do this? Well, it's disingenuous. But the Premier has self-admitted in the last budget that we have a revenue problem. But get her to tell you that before the election so you know her plan instead of after. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, before we, uh, this is the last question, I'm sorry good things must come to an end, so this is the last question before I wrap things up and then we ask all of the panelists to, po to pose for our traditional ATA group hug. <laughs> Male in the millennium, when I hug with a male, it's pee pee to pee pee, not tee pee to tee pee. So I just want to see, you know, how. <laughs> Who's taking the picture of this all, by the way? <laughs> and this question is very appropriate. How would your party work towards creating a positive relationship between teachers and government? That question is only relevant in the context of the current bad relationship. Uh, so the reality is, is that to the extent that there is uh, a poison relationship or a lack of trust or a lack of faith, uh, that's this current regime. Uh, for the Alberta Party, the whole government, uh, we can ensure that the, the, the dialogue that we're interested in engaging professionals with, and this is a professional group, uh, are always going to be steeped in respect, in, in uh, listening to you, and uh, being involved in a partnership. Uh, and again, it's this inverted relationship. It's not going to be a talk to, it's going to be a talk with, and that's an assurance that the Alberta Party can give you. Well, I'm glad we got to finish with this question, because this is the one that's really near and dear to my heart. and. I have talked to Danielle Smith about this, and I've talked to Rob Anderson, who is our education critic, because, to be honest, at the beginning of the Wild Rose Party, they were, were trying to make educational decisions. And I said, no, we have to stop and talk to the experts, and those are the people in this room, and that's the ATA. The ATA does a ton of research in our professional development, and they're the people that know how best, what, what best practices are. So we, we are looking at and, and creating better, better um, committees. Uh, I, I, I almost said review type things, but I don't want to go down the review path. We, we, we want to work with the experts in the field. And the experts in the field are the ATA, the uh, professional development consortiums, um, some of the solution tree, uh, ASCD, the, the educational experts. We want to work with all of them. The answer is actually fairly simple. 
First of all, you need to elect a government that's champion of education, doesn't have a history of doing the other, and then decide, you know, change their mind and do the exact opposite. So you need to make sure that you have a government that consistently gets up every day and says, how can I make education better? The other thing you need to do is you need to make sure that you have a government that respects the rights of teachers to bargain, and you have to also be bargaining good faith and signing agreements and then honoring those agreements because that is what builds trust. It's not breaking your word, it's not legislating people back into work or threatening to do so. That is not about building trust. And so in the end, you need a representative who stands up as a champion of education. I believe that uh, you know that the education system has evolved along with its government you need a commitment from government to uh, publicly funded uh, education, uh, committed to uh, keeping communities together. I think you have to get them out of the, the business of funding uh, private schools, which uh, uh, serves to uh, cloud the issue. I think there has to be a real partnership between uh, the ATA and the provincial government. I think you can look at models like Finland who have actually essentially forged uh, this partnership. Regardless whether they elect a right or left government, there remains to be a commitment between the teachers and the government to providing the best education system in the world. And I think that's what needs to happen here. Regardless, the best publicly funded and delivered education in the world should be the goal of any government. And that's what I think we can try and create is work into that finished model. You know, I think in Alberta we're very modest at times. Um, David Cameron, the Prime Minister uh, of the UK, in his speech in the House of Commons last year, here in Canada, when he came to visit, talked about Alberta's education system being amongst the best in the world. Our Governor General spoke about, uh, Canada's Governor General spoke about how Alberta's education system is amongst the best and how the technologies that we have embedded into the classroom are, are nation leading. So that couldn't have happened if we're always at odds. I mean, we can always have differences of opinion when it comes to certain issues. But the bottom line is, my friends, we have a system today that we can celebrate. There's always room for improvement, and we will always seek improvement. We do not live in a world that is static, that is just standing at a standstill. We live in a world that is continuously changing. And so that means we have to have genuine, true commitment to public education to make sure that we can continuously work together, make changes that are necessary to ensure we remain one of the best public jurisdictions in the world. And the last question. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the closing comments. We've assigned two minutes. Uh, our timer, our brilliant, good-looking timer, <laughs> Mitchell, is going to hold up the one-minute card. Aren't you, Mitchell? Yes? He's going to remind you in 30 seconds, and then you'll hear the timeout. Um, he'll wink at everybody else. But in the case of man meat, he's going to come over and do a half Nelson on you. <laughs> so just a warning in advance here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in reverse order. And I won't keep, I won't keep coming up here. So gentlemen, if you just remember that Norm, you can go first. Mark, you can go second, followed by man meat third. Kevin, fourth. And the final closing two minutes to Kent. Gentlemen, you have two minutes each. Start your motors. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to address you tonight. Uh, this is sort of a, a policy coming out party for the Alberta party and for myself. And I'm uh, very proud to be here on behalf of the party, on behalf of uh, Greg Taylor, our leader. Public education, as I said at the outset, is something very near and dear to my heart and very near and dear to the, the heart and core of what the Alberta party stands for. Uh, there, there really is nothing more important or significant in the ongoing journey and story that is our culture and is our society than how we treat this particular uh, system, our public education system. <coughs> it needs to be the situation where uh, public dollars, and this is what we're talking about, public dollars are prioritized to the extent that public education 
uh, is getting what it needs and is a high priority and a high needs priority for any government. The reality is at this juncture in 2012, with the Alberta party being uh, the, the, the fledgling, the, the youngster on the block, we're not going to form government, and we recognize that, but what we are going to be is a very strong voice of accountability. We have uh, strong policy platforms, including this one, we believe. We think there's a lot that will resonate with you. I urge you to check out our policies, check out the party, check out who's running. Uh, we're an up-and-comer. Uh, we have uh, great ideas, and we want to listen to you. And one of our most powerful messages is that we trust you, you're professional, and we want to work with you in public education, is a high priority for all of us. Thank you very much. First thing, I want to thank everyone again for coming out, and uh, first of all, also inviting me to be able to speak to you. But also, I really want to thank you for the work you do. Uh, you guys are on the front lines fighting on behalf of kids, and that is, you know, they don't have representatives. They don't donate money, so they don't often get a voice. And it's important for you that you guys are out there standing up and making sure that public education is given the priority that needs to be given. And the Alberta New Democrats, we are your friends. We have stood up for you and we will continue to stand up for you. Um, you just need to look at the history. We were there on the front lines when Redford was voting with the government and was cutting, was involved in the cutting of, of the funding that we ha currently have. We've stood up and we will continue to stand up, stand up for your rights to bargain fairly and equally and we will continue to do so. Um, in the end, it's about electing people who you trust, who will be a champion, who will stand up when it's not always easy and not always popular, who will provide solutions, and who's not afraid to take a stand and say that maybe we need to make sure that education comes first. And when it come, when it, when, if you need to cut something, why are you cutting kids? You know, when you need to fund, when you, the times are good, why aren't you funding kids? So we see the, this government, whenever, whenever, Whenever there's been a time that the economy's taken a downturn, the first thing they go after is, 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 is the education system. And that is simply can't be done. We, we need to be making sure that's the last thing we ever cut. And the only time we should ever be closing down schools, we take, be laying off teachers, is at the very, very last resort. We need to look at ways we can actually increase our, re our, our financial resources as a problem so we can make sure that while we have a great education system and you guys all ensure it's a great education system that it can continue to improve and we don't have these the 56 hour weeks and the 30 people's in your 30 kids in your class we need to make sure that you know those kind of issues are addressed thank you very much i really appreciate everything thank you all very much it's a pleasure to be here i uh I'm always inspired by educators because you, you, you bring your passion out there on a daily basis. You bring your heart on the line. Uh, somebody I, I love and respect so much is my younger cousin who, who chose to work in Hobima uh, as a teacher. And the, the, the impact she's having on these children inspires me so much. Every single teacher can make a world of a difference for so many young people. It's the most beautiful and powerful thing ever. And uh, today, in my eyes, is a day of, of great achievement where we have uh, three years of predictable funding. And I can go on and on about statistics of how we're uh, increasing the educational funding, how we're looking at new and innovative ways for all of us to work together to ensure that our young people are committed to education as a lifelong pursuit. That all of us are committed to education as a lifelong pursuit. That we achieve greater rates of high school completion and post-secondary involvement. Uh, that we reduce barriers and empower teachers on the front line. Empower schools to make greater decisions locally. We're, we're adopting funding models that promote this. We're making real life change. A lot of other folks around uh, the table here can talk about hypotheticals. It's easy to talk about hypotheticals, but there's one party that can be judged on results, and the results are we have a very 
very successful public education system that every single teacher in this room, every single teacher in this province, and every single Albertan can and should be proud of. And our promise is we will continue to ensure we lead the world in public education. Well, I'd like to start by thanking you guys for coming out. It's, it's really wonderful to come into a room with educators with something that is near and dear to your heart and give us the chance to talk to you about it. So I'd like to thank the uh, both public and separate um, locals for putting this on tonight. And I'd like to thank the uh, panel members for coming out as well. It's, uh, sometimes it's tough, it's intimidating. I, I'm, I'm an educator, so I love education. I could talk about it all day and all night. But I understand how sometimes when you're not involved, it's, it's, it's a little more difficult to talk about. The Wild Rose Party is definitely dedicated to education. It is a priority, and it always will be. And although we are fiscally conservative, and we do look at where we can cut and save and spend, and spend money, um, we want to make sure that our province is in a go-ahead position, both in education, but fiscally as well. So yes, we, when Kent talks about cutting here and cutting there, education would be the one area that we would never ever want to cut. We need to keep our education, we need to keep moving forward for our children's sake. Um, the Finland model is a great model and I know that we're looking at it for a lot of different reasons, but part of the, the Finnish model came to be because of they were falling apart. Education in Alberta is doing great because of the people that we have in the schools right now and that are working so hard. And so the changes that we have to be making in education have to be done transformationally, which is a difficult concept. It, it, it takes minute steps over and over and over again. And we have to make sure that we have a system in place that's going to fund that sustainably for the next three, four, five years continuously. The Wild Rose is dedicated to education and we will look at it as our top priority for many years to come. Thank you very much for allowing me to come and talk with you tonight, and I, I look forward to talking more a little bit after. Thank you. Well, it truly really has been an honor and a privilege to be here tonight. Uh, I didn't let everyone know this, but uh, I was, uh, the, both my parents were, were school teachers, and I graduated from the uh, public education system and had an opportunity to go to university here in Alberta, and I'm thankful for our many other people in this room who uh, continue to battle for uh, recalcitrant and lackadaisical learners like I was <laughs> growing up. But nevertheless, they, we, uh, I think the best way to judge a government is on what they've done in the past and not on what they say they're going to do in the future. I'll finish the way we started. They've been tepid at best at their support uh, of public education of the, uh, over the years. Here's what uh, the Alberta Liberal Party will do. We've already laid it out in our platform. We will provide preschool, we will be moving into, into kindergarten, we will be eliminating those school fees. We will be sending you the money, by the way, so you can make up those school, school fees, so you, your parents can uh, come in and get the supplies they need and go forward from there. We will have a commitment to edu education, and uh, in my view, we have found a way to pay for it. That's why, if you're committed to public education in this system, uh, it, if you really have a belief in it, you have to say the elimination of the flat tax is simply the way we have to go. How can you have predictable, sustainable funding if you have uh, a flat tax system and you're basing on fossil fuel resources? Okay, not only is it unfair to the kids today, it's unfair to our future generations where we're spending uh, our oil and gas revenues, a one-time gift, on uh, paying today's bills. That would be like a, fa a farmer selling off the family farm to go on vacation uh, to Hawaii. We're telling you how we're gonna pay for it. We're telling you what we're gonna do for public education. Let's hope that the uh, uh, pri our Premier Redford tells us how she's gonna pay for all her promises in the upcoming election. Thanks. Gentlemen, you take a seat at bow, please. One more round of applause here for us. Now, I'm going to take some more applause for the enthusiastic president of ATA Local 38, Jenny Regal. You have some applause, for you.
Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the audience. Uh, there's many friendly faces that I know, uh, fellow elected representatives of employee groups at the CVE, one of our superintendents here is here, and, and many others. Um, thank you so much for coming out for, um, uh, I think, quite an amazing event, uh, a bit of a coup, I think, for us. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists very much. I know particularly today with the budget coming down this afternoon, it was a challenge for a few of you. So I'd like to thank uh, Manmeet, Norm, Kevin, Mark, and Kent for uh, being here and sharing their party's platforms with us. Uh, I'd like to thank the moderator, Brian. I think you did a great job of keeping the evening going. I'd like to thank that we had from uh, from Calgary separate from Rocky View and from the Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils thanks for the help that you gave us and I am just so incredibly proud of my political well it's ours really but well, no it's mine uh, political <laughs> action committee uh, this is a coup we have never done anything quite like this before and I know I'm not going to remember all your names, although I know who you all are. Could you all please stand? I am so proud of you. Yeah. Uh, we expect bigger and better things next time to get that political education uh, election grant out of uh, Barnett House. So, way to go. And again, thank you everyone. And thanks for letting me, thanks for asking Mitchell, because you knew I was going to have to thank people. We'd like to acknowledge our panelists, and I'd call Mitchell Ford. He has a presentation for most of you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. And no, we do have we do have something for you too. Uh, and again, just to. Uh, Echo Jenny's comments. I know tough day for for some of you, and we just really appreciate everybody coming down. And so we have a small uh, gift, a token of our appreciation. Uh, read it, and, and <coughs> as Brian was pointing out, this is a great book. Ten thousand hours to become an expert. I hope it doesn't take that long in politics, John. <laughs> so thank you all for coming out and enjoy. Thank you, Brian, also. Brian, thank you very much. Um, we just, while you're receiving gifts here, I, I want to say to the audience, if you'd like to, do the panelists have stay, time to stay and visit? Yes, thanks. Do you have time to stay and visit the audience for a minute? Okay, we'll just, if you could take a seat for a moment. Um, I want to, um, just a quick little story. Many years ago, I was asked to nominate a candidate who was running for the provincial election. And uh, 2,000 people came up for the nomination meeting. And I remember it was very intense. There was two candidates. And um, just, it was very, there was a lot of animosity at any rate. I did the introduction for one of the candidates. And uh, so they went to the county room and it was just pandemonium all over the place. And I had to leave, come back. When I came back, my candidate had left because he thought he'd lost and went to the, the Legion with all of his friends. <laughs> and uh, so I was kind of the last remaining representative of that campaign. And I remember the executive director of the party got up and announced the results. Uh, the opponent, op opposing candidate got 973 votes and my candidate got 974 votes. <laughs> he won by one vote. There wasn't a recount. They had counted and counted and counted it. And I remember going over to the party that night, and absolutely everybody that came up to me said, you know what they said? They said, you know that one vote that made the difference? That was me. <laughs> so folks, we're coming out into an election. We have no idea what the outcome is, but I've never seen a more uh, highly contested level of interest in provincial politics. Uh, I think this evening represents our keen interest in how significant what's going to happen throughout the provinces for all of us, and who knows, that one vote could be you, or it could be your colleagues, so I challenge you all to participate. I want to leave with one a little bit of wisdom that I like to share at events like this. And it was a source of wisdom that I discovered from an anonymous statistician in Ottawa, which as you know, all source of wisdom comes out of that city. <laughs> and it did some interesting statistical research about who makes a difference. And it goes like this, the population of Canada is now 34 million. 
But there are 13 million over 65 years of age, leaving 21 million to do the work and make a difference. People under 16 total 12 million, leaving 9 million to make a difference. 4 million government employees, leaves 5 million to do the work. <laughs> didn't say teachers, didn't say teachers. 100,000 in the armed forces, leaves 4 million, deduct 1.5 million provincial city employees, which leaves 3.54 million to do all the work. Now there are 1,400,000 people in hospitals and asylums or sick. <laughs> which leaves this entire country 2 million people to do all the work, but 1.3 million of these are unemployed. <laughs> and 600,000 are in welfare and work, so that leaves this entire nation, including this province, 100,000 people to do the work and make a difference. Now, it may interest you to know that at any given time, there are 80,000 people out of the country. <laughs> <laughs> which leaves, which leaves 20,000. But 19,900 are in jail. So it's an entire country that leaves 100 people, which by my count is exactly the number of people in this room. So ladies and gentlemen, the future of our province is your hands. This meeting is adjourned.